So we're going to jump right in and today talk about the life of John Anderson, a pioneer photographer, um, chronicler of the Rosebud Sioux, and the founder of the Sioux Indian Museum. So quite an individual. Um, and I feel like I've gotten to know the history of John Anderson pretty well over the last 10 years, but it was, it was a lot of fun doing the research for this presentation as well, too, because every time I dive into it, I discover something new and interesting. So I've got some great photos for you and some great stories, um, and I hope you all can stick around and take a closer look at the exhibit um, that we put up. Um, these are all... Uh, these aren't originals, they're not the 150-year-old copies, um, but they are reproductions from the originals and original negatives, um, so just as good as these originals, and we don't have to worry about damaging them. Um, so, John Anderson, born in 1869 in, in Weinberg, Sweden, I'm going to guess. Is, um, his father was a poor tenant farmer. Um, John was the youngest of seven children, um, and his father was struggling to support the family on an acre of land. Um, Sweden, as you know, many other countries in Europe at the time, were facing some economic challenges. Um, mobi economic mobility was really limited for uh, most folks who were outside of the aristocracy. Opportunities for higher education and land ownership were very limited. So you know, there was obviously a lot of emigra em emigration. Um, the, uh, Great Irish emigration of the 1840s and 50s um, sort of led to the, the Swedish and Norwegian uh, emigration of the 1870s. And the Andersons were uh, just following kind of in that big footsteps. And in 1870, um, they left Sweden and arrived first in New York. Um, they spent a short time in Long Island and then ultimately moved on to Pennsylvania where they would live for a few years before heading west. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of the emigration, um, Weinberg had a population of about 1,500 people in 1870. Um, by 1890, they had lost almost a third of their population, 500 people to emigration. So um, quite a, a large scale movement. All right. So after just a couple years in Pennsylvania, um, the lure of the West called to uh, John's father, Alvin a Anders was his name, um, and they packed their bags and hopped on the train and headed west to Nebraska. Um, they arrived in Valentine initially, um, and then from there um, took a wagon to reach the small town of Sparks. Um, kind of hard to see on the map, but here's Valentine right here, the Rosebud Reservation, Mission, and Sparks is about maybe 20 miles east of Valentine proper. Um, their first home in classic uh, homesteader fashion was a sod house, um, but they pretty quickly set to work building a more permanent structure. And you can see their first wooden homestead um, there in the lower right corner. Uh, this was in the Sand Hills region of Nebraska, so fairly good fertile soil, um, conducive to farming. They were, of course, doing that. Um, but John's father was a carpenter by trade. Um, so in a perfect position to build a new family homestead, um, and that was his primary occupation in the area of Valentine. Um, he taught his children, um, John, as, his, as well as his brothers, to also be carpenters, and that was a skill and a trade that John would continue throughout his entire life. All right, so Fort Niobra, Fort Niobra, I always struggle to say that. You'd think after 10 years I would have it, but it's a, a mouthful. Um, and, and I'll use sort of Fort, Fort Niobra and Valentine uh, interchangeably because they are so close to each other. Um, but Valentine and Fort Niobra were very much the Wild West in 1885, um, just a couple years after the Andersons arrived. And there are stories of horse thieves being publicly hanged in town, um, of folks coming to town, cowboys coming to town, having too much to drink, shooting up the town, and uh, in turn being shot themselves by angry townspeople. Um, but the fort itself was built in 1880, and it was really a strategic location selected by General Crook. And we'll see Crook later. He plays a big role in this story. Um, and it was part of a military strategy following the conclusion of the Great Sioux War in 1876 to essentially encircle the entire reservation with forts um, in strategic locations, close proximity to um, major uh, uh, 
blanking on my word, but major settlements of the Lakota at the time, agencies, that's the word I was looking for. So the Spotted Tail Agency would become the Rosebud Reservation, and um, Niobaro was just south of Spotted Tail Agency. To the west, you have the Red Cloud Agency, which would become Pine Ridge, and Fort Robinson was the corresponding fort there. Um, the railroad first arrived there in 1882, and with it, it brought an economic boom. Um, settlement uh, increased. It was just a year after that that the Andersons would ride the train themselves to get there. Um, so we don't know exactly how and when Anderson purchased his first camera, but it seems it was about 1850, 1885. Um, he, we assume he saved his wages from carpentry and um, read everything he could get his hands on about photography and then purchased this camera. Um, he was teaching himself photography, but there were also several photographers who were arriving in Valentine um, during that 10 year, eight year range of 1883 to 1891. Um, and Anderson was fortunate enough to apprentice under one of them, a gentleman named Cross. Um, and he would continue to work with Cross for many years, um, but about 1888, he was able to establish his own photography studio. Um, so let's look behind the lens and kind of see the equipment that Anderson was using, because photography was still really in its infancy at this time. Um, and the first camera, um, or, or actually the first camera he purchased, we don't know much about. Um, and there's a funny story about that that was shared by uh, Anderson's nephew, great nephew, uh, Daniel Hogg, who was a photographer himself with the Smithsonian's River Basin Surveys. And uh, he says the camera which he has, he has one of um, Anderson, John Anderson's cameras, um, he's been told it's Uncle John's second. According to members of the family, his first camera was identical to the one that I have. Uncle John lost his first one in the line of duty. He was preparing to take, take a picture of a beef issue. The beef was still on the hoof. He had just focused his camera and still had his head under the dark cloth when on the ground glass, he saw a longhorn steer charging straight for him. The camera was demolished and we were lucky to salvage Uncle John. <laughs> um, so this was a large format camera um, shooting four by five negatives. Um, it had a Bosch and Loam lens, so a very high quality optical lens and a long focal length of about 12 inches. And that allowed for a couple of things. One, it allowed for wide perspectives. Um, it also allowed for very crisp focus, if you could get the focus right, which was a challenge back then. Um, and it also allowed objects to be slightly enlarged from life size. So I think that's one thing that gives a certain presence to a lot of Anderson's, particularly his portraits, as the figures seem maybe a little larger than life size. Um, now, this camera was manufactured by a company na named the Rochester Optical Company. Um, it would eventually be acquired by Eastman Kodak, and Eastman Kodak would continue to produce these Primo cameras for another 20 years or so. All right, so Anderson's dabbling in photography. Um, in his early years, he's photo do, most of his photography is happening actually at Fort Niobara. He's taking photos of soldiers and he tells stories about how they, they were good customers, but they would never pay him on time. But come payday, they would always pony up and uh, he would get his cash. He's learning tricks of the trades under cross, um, but his big break really came in 1889. Uh, with the Sioux Land Commission headed by General Crook. Um, now, the Land Commission of 1889 was sort of the last in a long series of political maneuvers by the U.S. government um, to secure land, additional land for homesteading, right? Um, we usually, when we talk about the Great Sioux Reservation and Lakota land claims, sort of the most important date that we talk about is the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. Right? And that came shortly after Red Cloud's war, in which Red Cloud and others um, were really actually pretty successful in blocking um, expansion of homesteaders into uh, the Dakota Territory and Montana, um, and uh, were successful in several uh, skirmishes and battles with the U.S. Army as well, too. So the tide was really in their favor. Um, and they got pretty favorable terms under the Fort Laramie Treaty. It created the Great Sioux Reservation, um, and you can see on this map, Essentially, they had all of western South Dakota, so everything west of the Missouri 
um, to what's now the Montana border was part of the Great Sioux Reservation. But that didn't last for very long. Um, and we had the Great Sioux Wars in 1875 and 1876. Um, and it what you know, and the great battle of that was the Battle of Little Bighorn, a great victory for Lakotas. But it wasn't very long after that that they had essentially been worn down militarily, um, and there was also a lot of disagreement among the various tribes about whether to continue to fight or whether to settle on the reservations um, as the U.S. Army wanted. Um, in fact, the what really started the Great Sioux War was a requirement by the US government that all tribes come into the reservations. Um, and that's really what led to the split among the factions um, and was used as an excuse by the US Army to then begin campaigns against Lakotas. They gave them a deadline, and if you didn't come into the reservation by then, you were fair game. Um, so we've got 1876, conclusion of the Great Sioux War. Um, 1877, Lakotas lose the Black Hills under the agreement of 1877, shortly after the Custer Expedition finds gold. Um, they were essentially forced into signing that agreement under threat of losing their rations. Um, so it was essentially a seller-starve agreement that they didn't have a lot of choice in. Um, and then in 1887 comes the Dawes Act, also called the General Allotment Act. Um, and that was the US government's attempt to make assimilation of native peoples move faster. Um, it was also an attempt to open up additional lands for homesteading. So the theory was every adult male within a tribe would be allotted 160 acres. And then once everyone had gotten their allotment, any additional land would be deemed surplus and sold. Um, so uh, essentially 1889, 1888, first the government sends um, Colonel Pratt at the time, and Colonel Pratt, you might know, he was most well known for uh, founding Carlisle Indian School. Um, his expedition was a disaster. He started at Standing Rock and basically gave up after one attempt, um, went home, and uh, the government then enlisted Crook to organize a new commission. Now Crook asked Anderson to serve as the official photographer of the commission while they were in Rosebud. Um, and this was kind of Anderson's big break, basically. Um, and he spent several days there. Um, Crook chose Rosebud for a strategic reason because he felt like the people living there would be most amenable to signing the treaty, right? Um, I'll also add that I, I sort of in preparing for this presentation and kind of recently another book that I was reading um, came across something that I didn't realize that was kind of fascinating in terms of a lot of the renegotiations of these initial treaties that were happening across the American West. And that is that they weren't really done in good faith by the US government because what would happen is Congress would pass a bill changing the boundaries of a reservation and then they would send a commission to collect the necessary signatures, right? So one way or the other, they were gonna get what they wanted. Um, and that's why they chose Crook, because they knew that he would get the job done. Um, and he really tried everything within his power, whether it was threatening withholding rations, whether it was promising things that he couldn't deliver. And as they say by hook or by crook, he got what he wanted, right? Um, there were speeches by Hollow Horn Bear, Two Strike, um, Crow Dog, prominent individuals speaking in favor or against the uh, claims. But ultimately, Crook got his signatures. He got uh, like 1,450 people of about 1,500 adult men to sign the treaty. He then moved on to Pine Ridge where he was much less successful um, and had less Red Cloud was leading the band there, um, obviously very opposed to uh, the cessation of additional Lakota lands and only got about 50% of the vote there in Pine Ridge. Um, but he continued to visit reservation by reservation and eventually got the signatures that he needed. Um, and just the way that the commission operated too was very strategically calculated 
um, when the government first approached Lakota leaders about renegotiating the Fort Laramie Treaty. Well, first of all, they weren't happy because they had just signed a treaty 10 years ago, and here they were being asked to renegotiate, right? And in Lakota tradition, what they wanted to do was to call a great council and get leaders from all the Oyates together, right? Um, so that they could confer together. And the US government refused to do that. Um, they wanted to visit each reservation on its own because they knew it would be easier to convince folks in smaller groups. All right, so the land commission photography for which John Anderson has paid $20, the grand sum of $20, um, is sort of his first big professional break. Um, and then in 1891 is another really important development where he begins working at the Jordan Trading Post. Um, he's also working as a professional um, photographer, um, taking pictures of the um, reservation, right? But he's still kind of going back and forth between Valentine um, and Rosebud. The Trading Post that he's working at, and this is the first version of the Jordan Trading Post, um, was owned by a man named Charles Jordan. Um, he was a retired colonel in the U.S. Army, uh, cousin to Custer, uh, son of a famous, or grandson of a famous Civil War, Revolutionary War um, fighter. Um, and Charles Jordan actually married an uh, Oglala woman um, from Red Cloud's band and settled on Rosebud and opened this trading post. Um, his brother, who was still active in the U.S. Army, was the commander of Fort Robinson, 50 miles to the west at the time. Um, and here you can see an interior shot of the trading post fully stocked with goods. It was kind of a central place um, for gathering and commerce on the reservation. Um, let's see. All right, so um, actually, to back up a second, also in 1891, Anderson briefly went east to Pennsylvania. Um, in fact, he left Valentine just a few days after the Wounded Knee Massacre. And I really couldn't find much information specifically about that trip or why he took it, but it was a very brief trip, and I couldn't help but wonder if they were somehow related. Um, because Anderson always had a very close relationship um, sh with the Sichangu people of Rosebud um, from shortly after he the time he arrived in South Dakota. Um, so he heads to Pennsylvania, um, uh, December 18, actually very beginning of January um, 1891. He's back um, in back in South Dakota within six months, basically, um, and continues working at the trading post. And this is where he really starts to kind of ramp up his um, photography of the reservation and, and captures starts to capture just some incredible, incredible images. Um, this is a photo from 1892. Um, and speaking of the Sioux Land Commission of 1889, um, right, just three years later, yet another council held to try to get Lakotas to cede or sell even more land. Um, in this case, it was basically to try to negotiate for the sale of most of Tripp and Gregory counties um, to open it up for homesteading. All right. So, 1892, Anderson, late 1892, Anderson goes back to Pennsylvania. And this is sort of a theme I see throughout his life are these trips back and forth. Um, and sometimes it's for professional development, sometimes it's for recreation. Um, but I think it's really interesting that as, as, as sort of wild and wooly as the frontier was, he, throughout his life, continues to make these train voyages back east. Um, so 1892, he goes back to Pennsylvania, um, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, essentially the same area that he'd grown up in. Um, he studies at Potts Commercial College and he studies woodworking there. And he also gets a job for a furniture company. He spends some time working there. And this is where he really um, brings his craftsmanship to the next level. Um, he becomes a really expert cabinetry maker. Um, he would go on to often make custom frames for many of his prints that he was selling. Um, it's also there that he meets um, the woman who would become his wife, Myrtle Miller, and they get engaged. But he wasn't quite ready to marry Miller, Myrtle um, or bring her back to South Dakota. So in 1893, he's back in South Dakota. Um, and this time, 
he buys an interest, he buys a share of the ownership of the Jordan Trading Post, which becomes the Jordan Mercantile Exchange. Um, and he, uh, as I said, conti he's continuing to work on his photography, um, getting to be a little bit better known in the area, um, and continuing to build houses, do other cabinetry projects, um, also using his own cabinetry skills. Um, this is when he undertakes building a home for his soon-to-be wife. Um, this is a great photo. Um, this is probably about 1896, I think, um, of the inside of the Jordan Mercantile Exchange during a great blizzard, a terrible blizzard. So basically everybody was just huddled up in there for a couple of days uh, trying to stay warm and uh, right around the, the central fireplace there. Okay, so I, we talked, I mentioned John Anderson was the founder of the Sioux Indian Museum, and we'll talk more about that later, but I, it's also around this time that Anderson um, sort of begins his collection. And in 1885, he acquires his first Lakota artifact. Now, exactly what that is, I found two different versions in two different sources. They both agreed on 1885, but one claims it was a pair of dolls, another claims that it was a pair of dentalium shell drop earrings. So... Um, it told me I need to go back and do a little bit more research in the collection, and maybe we can determine actually which one it is from um, Anderson's own notes. And I also kind of discovered as I went through this that we've definitely, we've got some work to do with our electronic database because I was finding lots more information about the artifacts in hard files, old records from the 1930s and 40s especially than what's been captured um, in our electronic database, right? And, per, and one of the best examples of this is this shirt and headdress. Um, this, the, the photo is labeled as belonging to Hollow Hornbear, um, one of the great Brule chiefs. Um, and this is his shirt and his headdress. And the shirt I know we have identified um, as Hollow Hornbear's, but I don't think the headdress is. So, um, that's always kind of exciting uh, to get to revisit the collection and do some additional research. But. So he would continue to collect over the next 40 years. Um, obviously, owning part of the trading post gave him a, a good opportunity for that, um, and as did his photography business. Um, and eventually, he would have over 800 objects in the collection that would become the foundation of the Sioux Indian Museum. Again, um, he's ready to marry Miller, marry Myrtle, and bring her home to South Dakota. Um, they get married there in Pennsylvania, and they come back um, and settle in Rosebud. And there's, we're really fortunate that both Anderson um, and Myrtle uh, kept diaries and journals. Um, they weren't always consistent about it. Sometimes there were missing months, years even, um, but we do have them, and they're here in the collection too. Um, and the way that she described uh, Valentine and Rosebud in those years I thought was really fascinating as well too. So this is what she wrote in her journal shortly after she arrived there in Valentine. She said, there were no fast trains in those days, but we finally reached Valentine, Nebraska at one o'clock in the morning. I had never been out of the state of Pennsylvania before, and when we walked up the dark streets of Valentine, it all seemed pretty strange to me. We left in the morning with the team and buggy for Rosebud. It was the early part of November, but the day was warm and balmy, and it seemed to me like an endless trip, as it is 40 miles, and it took all day. Finally, I saw Rosebud in the distance. When Mr. Anderson asked me if I would be willing to come west for no more than two years until we got a start, little did I know that I would be in South Dakota for 40 years. But I cannot say God kindly closed my eyes, for my life in South Dakota were the happiest days. I am a dar, daughter of the American Revolution, and I think my ancestors must have left me a little of their old pioneer spirit. The Indians were pretty wild then, as it was shortly after the Wounded Knee outbreak, so I had thrills every day. I can remember so vividly when we were driving to Rosebud, I noticed a small bunch of cattle running. I said to Mr. Anderson, why are the big dogs chasing them? He looked and said, dogs, nothing. Those are gray wolves. I had read of gray wolves and how terrible they were, so I expected them to turn on us at once. But John said, they won't bother us as long as they have cattle to chase. But I watched from the back of the buggy until we were out of sight of them. 
Right, so 1897, the Andersons are back in Pennsylvania again, um, this time in Philadelphia, some kind of leisure, recreational trip, maybe visiting family or friends who are still there, and they welcome their son, Roscoe. Um, they, Roscoe was their only child. Um, he was very important to them, um, and they were just there briefly um, for his birth, then returned to South Dakota. Um, this time, Myrtle's parents came back to homestead on their own. Um, and here's Roscoe as a child, and then this is a photo of Roscoe with his dog, and you can see the Anderson home in the background. So, life at Rosebud. Um, it was quite a life at Rosebud for the Andersons. Um, they became very, very close friends with members of the tribe. Um, and you can see here Myrtle with Sarah Blue Eyes. Um, in fact, that dress that Sarah is wearing is also in the museum collection. Um, they enjoyed picnics and music um, with other uh, uh, people working at the trading post, the Indian agents and doctors, um, and Dr. Hardin um, was the doctor there at Rosebud. Um, but business was a little bit slow, and uh, Anderson actually took it upon himself to start an orchestra. He played the cornet. Um, uh, his brother at that time had also moved out there and was working with him, building houses. His brother played the clarinet. Um, they recruited a piano player, um, a violin player, and a few other musicians, and they would put on concerts um, for folks there. And one more quote from uh, Myrtle's diary that I think is really kind of captures it um, pretty well. And she says, in 1895, Rosebud had not changed since it was first built. Our little house was built of boards and lined with ceiling boards. On Thanksgiving Day, it had grown very cold and was snowing. I cooked our turkey in the little wood stove oven in our little lean-to kitchen. By that time, the kitchen was so cold that we put up a little sewing table in the living room as close to the coal stove as we could get it, then brought in our turkey, put in the middle of the table, sat up, sat up to the table with blankets around our shoulders, and ate our Thanksgiving dinner. We were truly thankful for the shelter that we had from that terrible storm outside. Later, we remodeled our house, finally put in a furnace, and were very comfortable. All right. So I think, oh, before I get into this, one other sort of important date during the 40 years that the Andersons were living in Rosebud was 1922, was sort of their first attempt to leave South Dakota permanently. Apparently John's health had been declining and they thought it would be good to move to California for his health. So they moved to Atas Atascadero, California. Um, the community was extremely sad. There were articles in the paper um, wishing them well, but hoping that they would return. And the community's wishes were granted. Uh, they only lasted about six months we're back in South Dakota yet again. So they just couldn't seem to escape the pole for quite a while there. Uh, but Anderson, the, the 30 or 40 years that he was there were a really critical time of transition and change um, for all Lakota people, of course, but um, Anderson was there documenting the Rosebud. So that's kind of what we'll focus on there. Um, and the next series of photos, the dichotomy of these photos is really kind of striking, where you see elements of traditional Lakota life being blended with m more modern Western um, aspects. And I think this photo of the two homes is really a perfect example, and we see this time and time again, right? The teepee right beside the log cabin. Um, and uh, Lakotas really didn't want to live in those log cabins to start off with. Um, but oftentimes, just because of lack of uh, resources to even make their own teepees, obviously the bison hides are basically gone at this point. They're being replaced with canvas. Um, the uh, Indian agents are really trying to encourage them to move into these homes as well, too. Um, and eventually, many of them did. Um, this photo is titled Prairie Church Service. And I just thought that was really amazing, too, that you, know, you still have um, these traditional camps, you can see the teepees are organized in circles for the most part, so there's still that um, uh, traditional layout of the camp circle, um, and yet uh, we have uh, priests and, and uh, other religious missionaries who have moved into the reservation. They're establishing mission churches and schools um, and working on conversion. Um, 
another really interesting thing that was happening in, then were these beef issues and the ration issues. And Anderson photographed these extensively. They were really quite big events, right? And life was pretty boring on the reservation for Lakotas. I mean, they were essentially confined to a very small area, not really free to come and go as they pleased. They needed a pass from the Indian agent even to go visit another reservation, um, Pine Ridge and Rosebud border in places, but they would still need that pass, right, to go from one reservation to the other. Um, so they were often looking for things to kind of spice up a otherwise dreary existence, and Beef Issue Day was one of those. And there was a certain nostalgia, right, <coughs> for the buffalo hunt. And one of the things that um, Indian agents sort of came up, Indian agents and Lakotas together came up with to make things a little bit more exciting um, for uh, general life and the beef issue was to stage these mock hunts. And they would essentially take the uh, daily allotment of beef and just turn them loose and try to get them to stampede. And then the warriors would mount up on their horses and take off after them just like they were hunting bison and try to bring them down while they were running. Um, and then you have women, again, using the beef that was issued um, as part of the government rations and allotment, but they're still drying it and um, making their traditional food products um, dried in the sun and with the aid of a fire as well, too. And just a couple last photos from that transitional time. Again, this is the allotment period. Um, the U.S. government is doing everything it can to encourage Lakotas to become farmers and ranchers. Um, kind of hard with a 160-acre allotment in that part of the country to do much farming. Ranching was a little bit more successful. Um, but you're, here you have uh, teams of Native women um, gathering hay, wild grass, and putting up hay. And there's a cart kind of you can see back there all loaded up with hay. Um, this is also the early years of the Indian police force. Um, and the BIA, well, it's Office of Indian Affairs at that time, um, but is recruiting tribal members to basically be their own police force. Um, and so here you have a photo of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Um, he's up here in his wagon. Uh, no, that's him right there in that giant uh, buffalo robe coat um, with a train of Indian police escorting him into Rosebud. Um, one particular event that really kind of illustrates this blending of two worlds perfectly was a 4th of July celebration in 1897. Um, and keep in mind at this point, the Sundance had been outlawed, traditional Lakota religious practices, uh, all of them against the law, right? Um, and I think the reason that this 4th of July celebration was so popular um, was that it allowed Lakotas an opportunity to you know, have a festival at approximately the same time as a Sundance. And um, we see this in the American Southwest a lot too, this blending of traditional Puebloan religious practices and beliefs with Spanish Catholicism so that they can still maintain a sense of their original traditions while sort of on the surface um, following the rules of the conqueror essentially. Um, so a guy named Reuben Quick Bear organized this festival. It lasted for six days and over 5,000 people attended. Um, it included dances of all kinds, um, religious services, uh, mock battles, uh, a parade that was over a mile long, and my favorite, a greased pig contest. Um, but I think Anderson, he was a talented landscape photographer without a doubt, took lots of photos of daily life also on the reservation, but I think it's his portraits that really are his greatest legacy. Um, and there's just something incredible about these photos. And again, he was at the right time and the right place, um, but he also, there's a respect for his subjects that I think comes through and he really, he really captured um, these individuals in, in such a wonderful way. And um, these two folks, uh, Crow Dog and Spotted Tail, there's, uh, I want to get my date right on here, but yeah, so um, Crow Dog killed Spotted Tail in 1881. Um, it was a very hope, high profile murder. Um, there are various accounts as to what the source of that um, disagreement was about. Uh, 
There are some allegations that it had to do over women and marriage of their families. Um, but another version, which I think is also credible, is that um, uh, Spotted Tail essentially, his band did not engage in the Great Sioux War of 1875 to 1876, and that Crow Dog kind of held that against him, right? Um, whatever the reason, they had a disagreement. Crow Dog kills Spotted Tail. He's arrested, tried in state court here in South Dakota up in Deadwood, um, and found guilty of murder, sentenced to hang. In 18, 1882, he's found guilty. Execution scheduled for 1883. Crow Dog, he's got a good lawyer who appeals to the Supreme Court saying, this is a violation of the Fort Laramie Treaty, right? The, the treaty outlines that Lakota should govern themselves within the boundaries of the reservation, right? That they have jurisdiction. And in fact, the uh, people on the reservation, they had already dispensed Lakota justice to Crow Dog, which was that Crow Dog had to pay, make restitution to Spotted Tail's family. Um, and he did that. And they sort of considered the matter settled. Um, however, the government didn't. The state of South Dakota didn't. Um, so the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually finds in favor of Crow Dog. And they say, yes, indeed, this is a violation of the Fort Laramie Treaty. They overturn the conviction and he's set free. However, the US government wasn't just gonna let things lie. Um, they didn't like that. So in 1885, Congress passes what's called the Major Crimes Act. And that gives the federal government jurisdiction over, over a, a classification of, there's about eight or nine ma what they define as major crimes. Murder, kidnapping, you know, violent, violent assault, um, things like that. Um, and we still, that law is still in effect. Um, sometimes there can be some good aspects of that, but there can also be some really problematic aspects to that. And there are a lot of allegations that, you know, the federal government often, federal sentences are often much harsher, and federal court is a much more challenging environment than, say, a state court. So some things that might just be a misdemeanor in state court, if you go to federal court, it's going to be a felony. Um, some of his portraits also capture these incredible artifacts. And these artifacts, I wanted to show this because these are some of the prizes of the Sioux Indian Museum collection. Um, and it's still unknown, you know, in some cases we know for sure that the clothing that people are wearing in the photographs, they really were their clothing. In other cases, it's probably likely that Anderson loaned clothing, finery, regalia, um, to people to wear just for photos. Edward Curtis was very well known for doing that. But I think in Anderson, generally, these were these people's original items. And, and Anderson would take the photo and then, I assume, maybe see if he could purchase some of the items in them. Um, so this is uh, uh, Grace's Our Lobby, this portrait of Fool Bull. Um, just a great image. The, the gradient of colors that he had, of grayscale that he has there is incredible. The focus is so crisp and sharp. Um, the shield that Fool Bull wearies, w carries, he um, had that at the Battle of Greasy Grass, Little Bighorn, um, and that's now one of our, our signature pieces at the museum, um, as, as also his club and the bear claw necklace, right? This is a photo of uh, Sam Kilstu painting a copy of the Big Missouri Winter Count. This is the copy that's on display in the museum, um, and we have the shirt, too, that he's wearing um, also in the museum collection. So we're really fortunate, I think, as, as an institution, the Sioux Indian Museum, to have this kind of documentation for the items in the collection, have photographs of them with their original owners and seeing them in use. It's pretty special. Uh, one other anecdote that I just wanted to share, because Anderson, right, he's just kind of everywhere and connected to so much. Um, so Ben Rifle, um, uh, uh, I'll back up. Roscoe Anderson, the Anderson son, dies in 1925, so fairly young. Um, and they were just kind of left a hole in their life as they grieved the loss of their only son. Um, that was the same year that they hired Ben Rifle to work as a clerk uh, at the trading post. And they really kind of almost viewed him as, a, as an adopted son. And they supported him throughout his life um, in his education. They supported him financially where they could. Um, he would. Uh, be on the cover. This is him as a young man playing flute, and that was 
uh, a featured image in a book that Myrtle Anderson wrote um, called Sioux Memory Gems. Um, and then Rifle would go on to have a long career with BIA. Um, in 1960, he's elected to Congress um, from, I think, the first di district of South Dakota, East River, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, he's the first Lakota elected to Congress. And during the tumultuous period of the 1960s, is the only Native American in Congress. Um, and then in 1970, he, he serves four terms in Congress. Um, and then in 1972, two, I think, is appointed uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, so running BIA. So quite a career um, that certainly was influenced by the Andersons. All right, so Anderson had quite a life in Rosebud. He spent 40 years there. Um, as he reached his uh, uh, golden years, he was looking to slow down a little bit. He, 1936, he sells the trading post and he moves to Rapid City and he brings his collection with him. Um, he had apparently previously exhibited small parts of it at Sioux San, um, but in 36, he moves here and he sets up his collection in the just recently built building in Halley Park. Um, I was talking with um, Mark from Minnelusa, just sort of about the history of the museum. We're always trying to kind of piece together more information about it. Um, and it's interesting because that, that building was built to be a museum. And I had it in my head that it was built to house Anderson's collection. And I think that that could be right. It also seems like maybe it was built um, that some of the people pushing for it to be built had in mind that it would house pioneer collections, right? Or maybe both. Um, and there are some interesting correspondence from 36 to 38 back and forth between um, the Office of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the uh, city council and the city council's attorney over what ultimate use the building would have, who could show things in it. Um, but in 36, Anderson, um, Sorry, 36, he sets up the museum. He organizes the original exhibits. As you see it here, this is all Anderson's layout. Um, he's got his photos on display there. He's writing the labels. He's giving tours. They're charging admission. Um, but his health continues to decline. Uh, and in 1938, he sells the collection um, to the federal government. And then in 1939, he and his wife moved permanently this time to a task Cascadero, California. Um, and then Anderson would pass away in 1954, stomach cancer. Um, his wife Myrtle survived him by another 10 years or so and passed away in 67, I believe. And with that, we are done. So hope you all enjoyed that. If you have any questions, please let me know. That's a good question, and I could talk about that for a while. Um, I think, and, and I'll, often my answer to this is it, it depends, right? It depends on who you talk to. And there's no one answer, and I don't really want to speak for other people, but my general sense is that I think people are fairly comfortable that the collection is here. Part of it is that there's a certain stability, right, in it being a federally owned collection. Um, and a stability in the funding and things like that. So I, I, the, my experience have been you know, that people are, are happy that the collection is here. Um, but part of me wonders too, you know, when we talk about native collections, especially when we get into NAGPRA and those discussions is what constitutes legitimate ownership, right, of that collection. Obviously, you dig something up out of a burial you know, that's not a legitimate ownership. It needs to be repatriated. And um, there's nothing, nothing in the records to suggest that Anderson was unethical in his collection, uh, collecting. I think he, he purchased items. He traded for items, right? Um, all the records it, uh, that we have show a deep respect and appreciation for Lakota people and really trying to help them out as much as he could. At the same time, 
you know, he's buying these items, but he's buying them from people who are, in many cases, I mean, they're trying to feed their children, and they didn't really necessarily have a lot of choice about whether to sell grandma and grandpa's regalia or finery. So, I mean, I even, I have conflict about it, and I think all museums really should. It's a really gray and tricky area, you know, um, and there's no easy answer there, I think. Uh, you know, I went there actually a few years ago. There is actually a fair bit. Uh, they have a nice visitor center. You can see some, there's not a lot of full structures remaining. Um, and it's now part of the, I think it's the Valentine National Wildlife Refuge. It's on the grounds there, but it's a beautiful area. If you haven't been, I highly, highly recommend it. It's worth a visit. And the river, the Niobar River is spectacular there. Um, there's some, Anderson, actually, I didn't show these photos, but he's got lots of photos of these, these waterfalls that are coming into the river there in the deep canyon. And there are still some of the original structures there. It's just a few hours. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that is a good question. And that was something that I forgot when I was talking. So the, the question was, what were the logistics of hauling the camera around and photography in the late 1800s? Um, and it certainly wasn't easy. Um, and oh, I forgot my last little quote that I'll read you. But um, one thing that helped Anderson immensely was that he started taking photographs just after the development of dry plates, right? So prior to that, and for those of you who aren't familiar with photography, originally photography was done, the negatives were on hard glass plates and everything had to be kept wet, right? So you'd have your, your negative and then you'd get it wet to take the picture and you had to keep it wet to develop it and if it dried out at any point, you were kind of screwed. Um, but Anderson came along um, they had developed dry plate technology. They were still using glass plates. Um, we weren't quite yet to the nitrate film era, um, but that certainly did help. Um, but yeah, he, in, in his journals, he does talk about the difficulties of trying to haul this whole apparatus and then exposure too. That's the other thing that's really amazing about his um, photography is that Exposure meters, if they existed at all back then, were very primitive. So a lot of times you're just guessing um, in terms of the exposure. Um, he could obviously see the subject on the ground glass in the back of the camera and, and get pretty good focus. Um, but it was, it was definitely a kind of an all-day affair for him often when he would go out to do these cameras and kind of haul everything around. Um, but the last little blurb I was going to read actually um, was from... Um, Wayne Nelson, who was a staff photographer also for the Smithsonian River Basin Surveys, and he said, like most successful pioneer photographers, John Anderson was both artist and technician, in the latter of necessity. The early day photographer controlled and judged light intensity by trial and error. He had to process his own film in a covered wagon or a darkened bedroom with minimal temperature control of solutions. He often varied his shutter speed and lens opening on the basis of little more than a hunch. He loaded his bulky equipment and traveled by horseback, team, and buckboard or stage. And if he had the patience, insight, skill, and perceptiveness of a John Anderson, he came back with outstanding and historically important pictures of early mission and reservation towns such as Rosebud and Pine Ridge. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks so much for coming, everybody. Make sure to come back next week and see us with Jeff Bacon.